Hello everybody and welcome back. We continue our exploration of the context for the English Romantics in lesson number 4, part 2 of Empire. When we concluded the previous lesson, lesson number 3, I mentioned the fact that we need to see the English Romantics as being transnational in their interests, exchanges, connections and influences. We extend that into this lesson as well. So the Empire and the Colony were responsible for the transnational nature of the English Romantics as contemporary critics have been arguing. One of the more significant socio-cultural contexts that informed the Romantics and directly uh, connected to their transnational linkages was the question of slavery. There were other dimensions as well. The concern with Native Americans in Sadi, Robert Sadi, William Wordsworth and others. Their interest in commodities. But the focus for our present lesson, one of the focus would be slavery. The 1780-1830 debates around slavery including abolitionist rhetoric, abolitionist poetry, focused on the trauma of the enslaved African, the exploitative nature of colonial labor, and as such, indicated the widespread interest in the racial and cultural other. Many writers did see the plantations in the colonies as spaces where there would be the benevolent Englishman. The benevolent Englishman is a stereotype of this particular period. Other texts mapped the conquest and settlement of the Caribbean, James Granger's long poem, The Sugar Cane, 1764, is one such. The poem was a pain to the crop, but also glorified slavery by demonstrating how, quote, with placid looks and willing ardor, the slaves went to work in the Englishman's plantation. In short, the plantation and slavery becomes a symbol of England's national culture itself. We will pay some attention to an extraordinary text which falls within our ambit of the Romantic period, Maria Edgeworth's short story, The Grateful Negro, published in 1804, where the slaves of Mr. Edwards have little gardens attached to their huts and they get one day to cultivate them. Unlike crops and therefore, you have a laboring system which is happy to work for the Englishman, where they are loyal, harmless, committed, and loving towards the Englishman. So the benevolent Englishman is central to the reinvention of slavery itself. So while there were critics of course who said slavery is bad and we are doing terrible things out there, there was a trope of the benevolent Englishman that said, well, you know, there could be bad slave owners and good slave owners and several of the Englishmen are good. So loyalty and acts of benevolence in the course of the cultivation process, in the process of keeping the plantation going are documented in several stories such as Edgeworth's. Here is a passage for you to see and that's your first slide. The protagonist is of course a man called Caesar, a slave and uh, this particular passage which is up there for you goes like this. Caesar, the slave had no knife and Edwards, that is the English uh, owner, gives him his knife and he says, it is very sharp, he added, smiling and then he says, but I'm not one of those masters who are afraid to trust their Negroes with sharp knives. Then comes a key point that Edgeworth makes. These words were spoken with perfect simplicity. Mr. Edwards had no suspicion. Look at the trusting nature of the Englishman, huh? At this time of what was passing in the Negro's mind. Caesar received the knife without uttering a syllable. But no sooner was Mr. Edwards out of sight than he knelt down and in a transport of gratitude swore that he would stab himself rather than cause damage, harm to the master. What is he doing here? Mr. Edwards has entrusted the knife to the black man, to the slave, showing an implicit trust in the black man. And the slave is so overwhelmed, so overcome with gratitude at this trust that he swears that he'll kill himself rather than turn the knife against his white master. Here is a continuation of Edwards' description of Caesar on slide two. This is what Edwards says. The principle of gratitude conquered every other sensation. The mind of Caesar was not insensible to the charms of freedom. He knew the Negro conspirators had so taken their measures that there was the greatest probability of their success. His heart beat high at the idea of recovering his liberty. So Caesar is torn between, uh, as you will discover if you read the story, between a whole group of conspirators who want to overthrow their white masters and acquire freedom. But Caesar is also bound by a terrific sense of loyalty towards his master. And Edward suggests that this is a good slave. This is a good slave produced by the good master. So in some sense, you have to link this to the abolitionist rhetoric of the time. 
as to the various angles through which slavery was explored. Here is another one for you from William Cooper's poem, Charity, which is up there on your next slide. Cooper writes, bid suffer it a while. This is the instruction to the black man. And he's saying, bid suffer this, suffer slavery for a while and kiss the rod. Wait for the dawning of a brighter day and snap the chain the moment when you may. Nature imprints upon water we see that has a heart and life in it. Be free. The beasts are chartered. Neither age nor force can quell the love of freedom in a horse. He breaks the cord that held him at the rack and conscious of an unencumbered back. Snuffs up the morning air, forgets the rain, loose fly his forelock and his ample mane. Responsive to the distant neigh, he neighs, nor stops till overleaping all delays, he finds the pasture where his fellows graze. We need to spend some time looking at this particular text. The horse is straining at the reins. And for Cooper, the horse is straining for freedom. The urge for freedom, which he says, cannot be put down. But the animalizing of the slave in the analogy establishes an easy equivalence between the slave on the one hand and the animal, between the human and the animal. Demonstrating raw physical power, both the animal and the black slave can only fight in purely physical terms. They can fight the restrictions placed upon them. It also recalls, and some of you might be aware of this, the far older stereotyping of the black man as an animal. So the savagery implicit in the Cooper rhetoric is actually part of the analogy and metaphor of an entire discourse of colonialism and slavery in its account of the non-Europeans. So to go back to the poem briefly, look at what he's saying. The beasts are chartered, as in they are regulated, they are bonded, and the bit around the horse, the reins around the horse, symbols of its being restricted and the lack of freedom. And he says, uh, this is the horse driven by the need for freedom, straining at the leash, straining at the reins. The point is, the rhetoric equates the human, the black human, with the animal. And just as the animal can only attempt freedom, attempt to gain freedom through sheer physical power, the black man can also do just that. In other words, the black man is reduced to the basic corporeal body alone. There's nothing else to the black man. This is a stereotype. In the anti-slavery poetry of the 1760-1840 period, the slave is not despised exotic other there is a little else, something else going on. Let's take a look at a radical uh, poet, William Blake in The Little Black Boy. That's up as your next slide. This is what the young boy says. My mother bore me in the southern wild, and I am black. But oh, my soul is white. White as an angel is the English child, but I am black as if bereaved of light. Now, Blake in his usual system, engages upon a constant play of black and white, of light and darkness. It's something sustained through Blake's entire corpus. But look at what the boy is saying. My mother bore me in the southern wild. And the wild is a trope, a metaphor, that applies as much as to the setting as to the person, like the animal and the human. I am black, but my soul is white. White as an angel is the English child, but I am black. But you see his soul, he says, is white. So Blake contrasts the black boy and its collateral, the dark continent, the nickname for Africa during this period, and the white one. But also suggests that the soul of the black boy is as white as could be. Take another instance. Hannah Moore's famous poem published in 1788, Slavery, a poem, up on your next slide. This is what Hannah Moore says. They have heads to think and hearts to feel, and souls to act with firm though erring zeal. For they have keen affections, kind desires, love strong as death, and active patriot fires. All the rude energy, the fervent flame of high-souled passion, and ingenuous shame. Strong but luxuriant, virtues boldly shoot from the wild vigor of a savage root. And she continues in other parts of the poem, in all the love of home and freedom reign, and though dark and savage, ignorant and blind, they still are men. Finally, there needs no logic sure to make us feel. The nerve, however, untutored can sustain a sharp, 
unutterable sense of pain. Moore begins by proposing that the blacks have the power of rationality and then changes this to say that they are full of passion and emotions. Note what she's saying, they have heads to think and hearts to feel. Then she says, they may act, but they will act through erring zeal, as in they are not very competent when they are using their rationality, but they have keen affections and kind desires and love strong as death. Their energy is rude. These are the virtues of the slave. So what is there that you see? The slave is corporeal body and not rational, but emotional. Doesn't have intellect, but has sentiment. So you see, this is your stereotype. This is your very clear binary. The white man is both strong corporeally, as in physically, but also strong mentally, as in intellectually and rationally. The black, on the other hand, is a guy who is tough physically, but mentally is nothing much to write home about. Instead, he's an emotional creature. And please recall what we have already seen in our early slides of Edgeworth's description of Caesar, his heart so overcome with emotion, overwhelmed, and so on and so forth. So Moore begins by proposing that the blacks have the power of rationality and then smoothly shifts this by saying they are full of passion. Moore calls for a compassionate treatment of these poor souls. What is it we learn from these examples, from Hannah Moore, William Cooper and all these others, uh, Blake of course. What we discover is with the expansion of imperial dominion, with expansion of geographical territory, England and its authors, England and its reading public, England and its statesmen began to encounter people of different races, people of different cultural traditions and cultural practices. It meant engaging with them, trying to understand them. There is of course conquest and the resulting stereotypes as you have seen in the case of Hannah Moore or uh, William Cooper presents the slave in particular ways. That these are negative stereotypes goes without saying, but what's important is this becomes a subject of poetry. So for those of us who thought that all romantic poetry is about the English countryside, about Tintern abbeys and ruined castles, you need to understand that English poetry and fiction of this period was equally concerned about racial and cultural difference. The empire fueled larger debates on slavery, but also of humanitarian imperialism. It gives rise to one more category of racial and cultural other. So having looked at slaves, let's now take a look at the noble savage a stereotype which is dated back to the 17th century. The exoticization of the other here is a process through which a very clear binary between a civilized but rather unhappy Christian and the pagan and happy Indian is forged. That is, though Christian, the Englishman is unhappy and though pagan, the Native American or Indian is happy. The innocence of the civil savage was of course a marker of a pre-modern primitive life and was therefore considered pure prelapsarian. In the age of Wordsworth, particularly innocence, the term innocence of children was of considerable cultural currency. And the comparison of the child and his innocence was to the innocence of the Indian, the East Indian. Here is Wordsworth's description uh, from the first book of the 1805 prelude, up on your next slide. And this is what he says. Many a time have I, a five years child, this is Wordsworth speaking about himself as a five year old child, a naked boy, in one delightful rill, a little mill race severed from his stream, made one long bathing of a summer's day, basked in the sun and plunged and basked again. Alternate all a summer's day or coast over the sandy fields, leaping through the groves of yellow ground zell. Or when crag and hill, the woods and distant skidaw's lofty height were bronzed with a deep radiance, stood alone beneath the sky. And then he makes his analogy. All this thing about the child running, playing, carefree, innocent, his comparison is as if I had been born on Indian plains and from a mother's hut had run abroad in wantonness to sport. What's he saying here? The innocence within quotes of the child, the harmlessness and the joy of being unfettered, of being unrestricted in the child is comparable to the Indian. You might remember, some of you, Alexander Pope who refers to the untutored mind. The untutored mind of the Native American, the non-European. So the non-European other is actually carefree, not encumbered with learning, wisdom or rationality. 
And this is what he says, as if I had been born on Indian plains and from my mother's hut had run abroad in wantonness. Here wantonness refers to unrestrained freedom. You will see this in several Wordsworth poems, such as Her Eyes Are Wild. You will see it in Felicia Heyman's The Indian City. Robert Sadi is the dirge of the American widow, where the Native American woman is a picture of grief, inadequacy, and even revenge. In both Hemans' and Sadi's text, the women embark on a saga of bloody revenge. The savage here in these cases is not simply a primitive creature. It is the noble savage here is one whose moral values, sentimentality are almost on par with the English. That's why a noble savage. Now, what do we take back from this particular lesson? What you need to understand is there are two clear political social agendas that come out of the imperial moment in English romantic writing. One is the abolitionist debate about slavery and the text we have seen, Maria Edgeworth, William Cooper, William Blake, posit the black, the African American and the African in certain ways. And the debate around slavery, whether it should be abolished or not, whether it, we should have a benevolent um, Englishman uh, who will inculcate a spirit of gratitude in the African or not is one. The second component is what we have just seen, the idea of the noble savage. Now in both cases, African and the noble savage, the black and the Indian, the English poet or novelist is engaging with racial and cultural difference. This is central to the imagining of England's responsibility as well. Critics have elsewhere argued that during this period, the 1790s to 1830s, you see the rise of humanitarian Im imperialism as well, where it becomes England's um, responsibility to be a moral imperialist and take care of people from other parts of the world. Keep this in mind, central to our understanding of the extended context for the English Romantic 1798 to 1832 is its transnational engagements. Thank you.